I want you to take your Bible, please, and let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 to begin with this morning. When you're turning there, the 2 Corinthians, I just wanted to mention the fact that if you've read your Bible very much or you've been a Christian for some time, you've prob probably already come to the realization that a lot of what the Bible says is really counterintuitive to human wisdom. That is, the Bible turns human wisdom on its head, turns it upside down. I mean, some things that you read, you th how could that be? Let me give you an example. Jesus says that in the kingdom, the greatest leaders are not the leaders that have the most people serving them, but the greatest leaders in the kingdom are themselves great servants. In our worldly way of thinking, you, you do everything you can. You tread on people to get up to the top. But Jesus says, no, the way to the top is down. The way to the top in God's eyes, is to humble yourself and let him work in and through your life. Second Corinthians really has that kind of wisdom. If you approach Second Corinthians that way, you're going to realize that what God teaches here, and this is the overarching theme of the book, what God teaches here is that your strongest experiences are going to be found in your moments of greatest weakness. And so I have titled our study of this book, The Strength of Weakness, a paradox. There is strength in weakness, the way God looks at it. And so I want to just survey this book briefly this morning. I've divided it up into three categories. The first seven verses really is the Christian life defined. And you're going to find strength in weakness. And then verse uh, chapters eight and nine, the Christian life demanded. There are some demands upon the Christian life in those two chapters. And then in verses, or I keep saying verses, chapters 10 through 13, you have the Christian life defended. And I'm using the term Christian life because I want it to apply to you. The book really is about ministry. But you know, if you're a believer, you're a minister. A minister is a servant. If you're a believer, you're in the ministry. You are in the service of the Lord Jesus. And so this is about the Christian life, which is a life of ministry. And I want to share with you some thoughts as we begin. But first, let's pause a moment and pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we realize that without you, we can't accomplish anything. Whatever is accomplished in human strength and human ability is just passing away like this world. But it is when we depend upon you and when we are strengthened supernaturally by the Spirit of God that the results are lasting, they're eternal. That's what we want in our time together this morning. Teach us this paradoxical, paradoxical truth, and yet a truth nonetheless. And that is that our weakest times can be our strongest times because God can turn us into conquerors and uh, victors and make us a blessing to those around us. That's the kind of lives we want to live. And so, Lord, use this time to just inform us and to speak to us. You know the spiritual need in each one of our hearts. 
speak accordingly, we pray. We ask it all to the glory of Jesus. Amen. So as I said, I gave you the brief outline of the book. First seven chapters is the Christian life defined. And it really is defined as you find strength in weakness. For instance, in the first chapter, he talks, the, the, the subject of the first chapter is really uh, suffering. You noticed as he begins in verse 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted. For our sufferings of Christ abound in us. So our consolation from Christ abounds in us. So the first chapter is about suffering. And the purpose of suffering, he tells us in this first chapter, is twofold. Are you ready? The first purpose is we suffer that we might become the recipients of God's comfort of God's consolation. But what we receive from God by way of comfort, we receive it so that we can share it with others. That's the first purpose in which we suffer tribulation or affliction. The second purpose, I guess you might say, is in verses 8 to 10, where he says, I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to be ignorant of this. I want you to know this. The trouble that we face, we were pressed without, uh, out of measure. We were pressed above our strength. We had no strength of ours left. In so much that we even despaired of life. We thought we were going to die physically. Verse 9, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. But here's the purpose of suffering. Secondly, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. And so it's very clear. Suffering is the means, affliction, tribulation is the means where we begin to experience strength of weakness. Through our suffering, through our tribulation, we are weakened so that we can then learn to rely upon the one who is truly strong. As he says in that ninth verse, we rely on him. And then the second chapter, we're talking about the Christian life as it's defined here. It's defined by suffering, but that reveals the strength that comes out of that weakness through suffering. The second chapter is about forgiving. There is a man in the church at Corinth that had been living in sin. And he was an offender. He offended the brethren. He, 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 was, a, he was an offended brother as a result of the discipline that the church had to put on him. But what Paul says in the second chapter is, okay, it's time to forgive him. And out of that forgiveness, this man is restored. So here he is, he's weakened by the disfellowship that he faces. But when he is forgiven, he's strengthened spiritually. And it's a message of forgiveness, not only to this individual that was living a sinful life, and repented in the church there in Corinth. But it's also a message of forgiveness, uh, of forgiveness to all. Look at what he says in chapter 2 and verse 14 and following. Thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor or the aroma of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one, we are the savor or the aroma of death unto death to those that reject Christ. To the other, we are the savor or the aroma of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? What he's saying is simply this. We are paraded in our weakness 
through the suffering persecution that we face. We're paraded as if we are non-entities, as if we are the scum of the earth. We're paraded in our weakness, but it is in our weakness that the wonderful fragrance of Christ is spread to all so that they have the opportunity to make a choice whether they're going to receive or reject Jesus. So again, you have the strength of weakness pictured here in chapter 2. In chapters 3 to 5, it's all about the fact that the believing life is not only a suffering life and a forgiving life, it is also a life-giving life. It's a life-giving thing. That's what chapter 3 to 5 is all about. It's Here really is the center of all Christian living. The Christian life is life-giving. And it is that because at the very center of the believer's life is God himself, the Holy Spirit. In chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, we are told in verse 6, that he has made us able ministers or servants of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit is life-giving. The Spirit giveth life. And so the Holy Spirit, and there's a contrast between the Old Covenant, that is the law of Moses, versus the New Covenant that was established with Jesus, And then the life-transforming power, the life-giving and life-transforming power that comes out of this new covenant. Look at verse 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a, a glass or mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Well, How does that impact others? Look at with with me again, chapter 4. Here we're told in the third verse that if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, verse 4, in whom the God of this world, whom we know to be Satan, hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay, so just as there was a veil over Moses' face that shrouded the glory of God that was reflected in his face from his meeting with God on Mount Sinai, Satan puts a veil over the minds of lost people so that they can't see the glory of the gospel of Christ. How is that veil penetrated? Well, let's read on. In chapter 4, if you'll drop down to verse 10, Paul's talking about himself and his missionary team. He says, we're troubled on every side. We're persecuted. We're cast down. Verse 10, we always bear about in our bodies the dying of Jesus. We live a death life. We live a crucified life. We bear in our body the dying of the Lord. Here's why. Look at verse 10. That the life also of Jesus might be revealed, might be made manifest in our bodies. For we which live, verse 11, are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. The Christian life is defined as being life-giving. But its life is given to others by our death, by us dying to ourselves. That's exactly what he's talking about in verses 10 to 12. It's through the suffering, persecuted believer. It's through the afflicted believer who is broken in body through suffering, that the glorious gospel of Christ shines through and is able to penetrate blinded minds. 
So it is in that weakness of our suffering and our affliction that the gospel shines most brightly. And that strength, the strength of weakness. And then in chapters 6 and 7, he defines the Christian life in another way. Chapter 1, he defined it as a suffering life. Chapter 2, as a forgiving life. Chapters 3 to 5, as a life-giving life. Chapter 6 and 7, he defines the Christian life as a sanctifying life. In fact, he says in the 16th verse of chapter 6, What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. The believer is sacred space because God lives in you. Your body, your life is sacred space. It is a, it is a spiritual shrine because God lives in you. And that is sanctifying that God lives in us. He sets us apart from everything else that would corrupt and that is profane and that is evil. We're God's temple. And you know what he wants his temple to be? He wants it to be clean. Look at chapter 7 and verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Let us cleanse ourselves. That's sanctifying. The Christian life is a sanctified life. It is a life that it's weak. The only difference between us and anyone else out on that street is that our lives have become sacred space because we have this, the, the God of heaven dwelling in us. And he takes an otherwise profane and uh, uh, in, in, in a worldly sense, a, a worthless life. And he gives it value. He sets it apart for himself. And there is strength in weakness. And God cleanses. The second point that as we do our survey of this letter, the Christian life defined for seven chapters, the Christian life demanded in chapters eight and nine. What do I mean by that? Well, chapters eight and nine are really at the heart of everything that the New Testament says about Christian giving. If you want to know the principles and the truths about giving, and specifically money, if you want to know what the New Testament has to say about giving, chapter 8 and 9 are where you'll get your info. And you know what it says? <laughs> it basically says that our giving is we are strengthened out of weakness. Here's what I mean by that. Look with me in chapter 8. And verse 2, where Paul is talking about the churches in Greece. And he says, how that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded. Poverty, weakness. They were financially weak. They were bankrupt, basically. But their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. There's strength. Out of weakness comes strength. Verse 3, for their power, I bear record, yea, beyond their power, they were willing to give. They had no giving power. They had to have God's strength in order to give. And look at how they did it, verse 5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. 
Believers are givers because we are the recipients of God's grace. Look at verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when I see that grace, that word grace, I think of God's ability. I think of God's strength. He says, you know the grace, the power, the strength, the ability of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor. Though he was strong, he became weak. That we through his weakness might be strong, might be rich. See it? This is what this book is speaking about and crying out every single chapter. It is strength out of weakness. And here in the very area of giving, we give only because we are the recipients of the giver. Only because we are the recipients of his grace, of his strength that enables us to give. And that provides the basis then for us to be reciprocal in our generosity. But notice the basis for that giving. In verse 5, they first gave their own selves to the Lord. You know, if God has you, he has your wallet and he has your bank account. He has all the all that, that you claim to possess. And so the bottom line is give yourself to the Lord. Well, that's that's a weakness. When you give yourself up, you're surrendering. You're putting yourself in a position of weakness. But out of that weakness, God brings strength. And he enables you to be generous. So the basis of all generosity to our Christian brothers or others, period, is grace-based. We don't give because of human pressure. In fact, look at what he says in chapter 9 and verses 7 and 8. He says, let every man give as he purposeth in his heart. Let him give. Not grudgingly. Oh, I have to. Or of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That you always have all sufficiency in all things. And may abound to every good work. What's he saying there? We don't give out of human pressure, but we trust God to use us to meet the needs of others. And God promises, and by the way, while you're doing that, I'll be meeting your needs too. One of the worst things we can do is hoard. When we hoard, we're saying, I don't trust you. I don't believe you, God. I don't think that you're going to meet my needs. So I'm going to hoard just uh, for safety here. And we make ourselves strong, we think, by hoarding. But actually, the opposite is true. We make ourselves strong in the area of giving, by giving. And that fosters, of course, great thankfulness to the Lord. It reminds me of a great illustration. A.B. Simpson, he, was, uh, he, uh, he, he is the founder of what is called the Christian and Missionary Alliance. It's a denomination. He's long with the Lord now. Started Nyack College up in Nyack, New York. I don't even think that college exists anymore. But anyway, <clears throat> at a great missions conference that uh, he was the speaker at, there was a woman and her husband that uh, were heading for the mission field. Her husband was a very successful businessman. But he had the call of God on his life to go to the mission field. And at the end of the conference, they took an offering. Well, they actually took more than one. The first offering, Simpson had uh, them to put in um, any money that the Lord would have them give or anything else. Um, for instance, jewelry. And so when the plate came around... Uh, Mrs. Kalman, her name was, she said she saw her husband take off his watch. 
and his wedding ring and put it in the offering plate. And she was horrified. How could he do that? And she gave him a, a mean look. Then the offering was taken and they said, Simpson said, we're going to take another offering. And so they took another offering. And when the plate came around, he looked at his wife and he pointed to her engagement ring. That was really bad. And reluctantly, she took it off of her finger. She gave it to her husband. He put that in the plate. The third time they took an offering, Simpson said, what we want to do now, now that you've given what you feel the Lord would have you to give, we want anyone here that senses that God has called them into missions to stand to their feet. And he stood to his feet and she kept seated. And then finally, she got the courage to stand up with him. God used that couple greatly on the mission field in the days ahead. I don't know if you've ever read the little devotional booklet called Streams in the Desert, but that was Mrs. Kalman that compiled those devotional thoughts that have been a blessing to many for, oh, decades now. Giving. Out of weakness, God strengthens givers. And then the last part of the book of 2 Corinthians, chapters 10 to 13, I call this the Christian life defended. The Christian life defended. Defined, demanded, and defended. And again, what happens here is Paul is actually defending his apostleship. Because there are some super apostles, some men that have put themselves forward in the Corinthian church that have questioned Paul's authority and his uh, rightful place as an apostle because he didn't have what they had. They put themselves forward as real apostles and they questioned Paul's authority. And so he's defending his authority in chapter 10, 11, 12, and 13. And again, what you're going to find is just the opposite of what you would expect. If you were attacked, what would you do to defend yourself? Perhaps you would talk about all your great qualifications, right? You know what Paul talks about to defend himself? He talks about his weakness. He talks about how weak he is. How broken a man he is to defend himself. The strength again of weakness. It's a man that is depending on God's resources and God's approval and not man's. In fact, 13 times in these four chapters, there is some form of the word weakness that is used by Paul to highlight the fact of his inadequacy. He's saying, I'm weak. I, 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 don't, I don't measure up to be an apostle. In chapter 10, he talks about authority. They're questioning his authority. And here is his authority. Here's the authority that you and I have the power, the authority to live the Christian life and serve the Lord. Look at what he says in verse 3. Though we walk in the flesh, though we live in a human body, we don't war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not human. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down, literally the demolishing of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What are you saying there? He's saying, here's my authority. 
I'm weak. But that's okay because I have Christ's resources. And they are mighty. They have the ability to destroy satanic strongholds and fortresses. I'm not looking at my own resources. I'm looking at what I have in Christ. And then these guys, these super apostles, they're building themselves up and looking for the approval of their peers and the Corinthians. And Paul says in verse 18, Let him that uh, glorieth glory in the Lord, for not he that commendeth or approves himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth, whom the Lord approves. So here's authority that really is the strength of weakness. It's Christ's resources and it's Christ's approval that really matters. In chapters 11 to 13, he's not talking so much about authority. He's talking about his ministry. And remember I said he defended his ministry by talking about his weakness. The believer's ministry and the believer serving the Lord causes certain forces to be put into action. And so there are dangers that come from that that Paul addresses here. The first danger in Christian living and serving is deception. That's chapter 11. Look at what he says there in that uh, uh, third verse. I fear lest by any means as, as the serpent beguiled or deceived Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, Satan is an ancient counterfeiter. He makes some pretty good counterfeits. He's, he, he, he fools a vast majority of the human population by his fakes, by his counterfeits. And that's what Paul is saying here. Be careful in your Christian living and in your ministry. Don't be deceived by satanic counterfeits because he produces good fakes. They have to be proved. They have to be tested and proven to show that they're real or not. Look at what he says in this uh, same chapter 11, down in verses 13 and 14. For such are false apostles. He's talking about his opponents. False apostles, deceitful workers, they transform themselves into the apostles of Christ, but that shouldn't be surprising, no marvel. That shouldn't be amazing to you. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. The test is not human ability, but supernatural enablement in affliction. That's how you avoid being deceived. That's how you avoid the deception in living and ministry. It's not human ability that is to be looked to and exalted, but rather the supernatural enablement of God in a person's life who is suffering affliction. That's God. That's real. So don't be deceived. And in chapter 12, he talks about another danger in Christian life and ministry. Not only deception, but I call the, the 12th chapter the, the, the danger of inflation. And I'm not talking about financial inflation. Here's what I mean by it. Drop down with me uh, to verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. See what he's saying there? I would tend, as any human being, Paul is saying, because of God's 
revelations to me because of the privilege that he's given me. He talks in this chapter of being lifted and brought into the third heaven, the very before the very throne of God, and uh, and had revelations from uh, from the Lord that no one else had, and to protect him from an inflated and an exaggerated sense of self-importance, God humbles him by giving him what he calls a thorn in the flesh, a permanent stake to impale him, to temper his inflated sense of importance. It would be what humans would do. And in doing so, in giving him this thorn in the flesh, it humbles Paul by totally weakening, weakening him. He has no strength left. And he cries out to the Lord and asks the Lord to take this thorn in the flesh from him. And God says in verse 9, no. He says, my grace, my strength is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect or complete in your weakness. And so again, an exposure of Paul's utter weakness reveals his necessity of God's enabling strength. Same with us. The afflictions, the sufferings, the tribulation, the trial that God allows us to face and to go through is to expose our utter weakness. I, we can't function this way, Lord. So that then we depend upon the strength that he enables us with. Keeps us humble. There's a third danger in Christian living and, uh, and ministry. And it's found in chapter 13. And I call this the danger of failing examination. See what he says in verse 5? Examine yourselves, 13.5, see it? Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. But I trust you shall know that we are not reprobates. Check for genuine faith is what he's saying. What is a reprobate? A reprobate is simply a person that God disqualifies, a person that God disapproves of. A person that is a reprobate is a person that does not possess believing loyalty in the Lord. They have either abandoned and they are devoid of personal faith in the Lord, and they are instead depending upon themselves, self-dependence. It's the opposite of strength out of weakness. Examine yourselves, he said. So 2 Corinthians, really, to boil it all down, it reveals that the Christian life isn't a party. It's not an easy life. But nonetheless, you can have, and you should have, real joy as a believer. The theme of the book is, Humble weakness. Humble weakness is the door that opens us up to experience the power of God in our lives. Hudson Taylor was a famous missionary and the founder of what was then called the China Inland Mission. And he knew this secret of strength through weakness. One time he was complimented by a friend on the impact of his mission and Taylor answered, it seemed to me that God looked over the whole world to find a man who was weak enough to do his work. And when he at last found me, he said, yeah, he's weak enough. He'll do. And then he said this, all God's giants have been weak men who have done great things for God because they reckoned on God being with them. By that he meant they depended upon 
the reality of God's presence in their lives. And they depended upon the power of God to accomplish in and through them whatever God desired to do with them. And that's exactly what it means. This whole book of 2 Corinthians is strength out of weakness or the strength of weakness. I remember quite a few years ago now when I was reading Hebrews 11, that hero's hall of faith. And toward the end of that chapter, he, he simply sums it all up and he says, out of weakness they were made strong. In order to be made strong out of weakness, it requires faith on your part. It requires that you believe God. It requires that you come to a place in your life where you recognize I'm incapable, I'm inadequate, I need God. That first comes to light when you trust him as your personal savior. I'm inadequate of finding my way to heaven. I'm inadequate of earning. I can't earn God's favor. I'm dependent upon him to save me. And he has provided the way through the sending of his son. Crucified his son because of you and for you. Took your place, took your punishment. But also as believers, it's continued demand. You recognize I'm insufficient. A couple of times in this book, Paul says, who's sufficient for these things? Who's adequate for this? And it's a rhetorical question. He simply wants us to, to admit, you know what? He's not and I'm not. I'm inadequate to live the Christian life. I'm inadequate to serve the Lord. But all the resources and all the power is sufficient in Christ. 